Hello? Oh, it's on. <coughs> you know, I find it funny. Um, a couple years ago, I really believed that I had a lot to say. And for whatever reason, I just never got a chance to say it. And now, I can honestly say, I really don't have anything to say. <laughs> but yet, here I stand. And uh, the reason I think it's interesting is because I, I truly believe, I really do, that in less than 10 years, the Lord's coming back in the rapture. I, I believe that with all my heart, and I, I can go on that. And when you really start to look at that, you realize that all this other stuff's got nothing to do with anything. But I am up here, so I should probably say something. So, um, uh, Wes, will you do me a favor? Will you please pray for the service and the message to come? Forget about government. Forget about politics. Forget about religion. Forget about what you're going to be doing later after the service. Forget about your family. Forget about your personal opinion about me. Forget about your personal opinion about everybody else in this room. Forget about all of your problems. And for the next couple of minutes, I implore you to focus on one thing and one thing only, the cross. Amen. Amen. The one event in human history that single-handedly changed the course of all eternity. It seems as though this ever-important event, for whatever reason, has lost the impact on those who swear its importance to them. And for others, it's just something to mock, something to laugh at, ridicule, or just plain despise. And while all the world is constantly telling us to look forward and move forward, I ask that instead we all look back, back to the cross. Amen. Before I do that, I would like to tell you three quick little stories. The first is about a young girl. Picture her running through the fields, having fun, no worries or cares. Innocent. Just having a good time. She finally becomes tired and just day lays down looking up at the blue sky, imagining how handsome her husband is going to be. What it's like going to be married and having kids of her own. The possibilities are endless and the anticipation of her future excites her. Moving forward, this young girl becomes a woman. And, for whatever reason, her life does not go the exact way as if she planned. In fact, quite the opposite. She's now a prostitute. A woman who sells her body in exchange for money to men who have no other objective than to fulfill their lustful desires with her. <coughs> Picture her, one day sitting there, defeated, wondering to herself, how did I get to this place in my life? The next brief story I have is about a farmer. A man who has a family, kids, and does whatever he can to get by. Times are tough, and his animals are his only means of income. One day, a donkey of his gives birth. A peculiar looking animal, right away this farmer knows that there's something different about this animal. As time went on, and as the animal grew, it was completely rebellious against everything. Fighting with all of the other animals, destroying crops, constantly kicking, and this donkey would not let another human being near it, let alone ride it. Infuriated and worried about the well-being of his farm, 
he decides to kill this wild beast. He goes up to the donkey one night, and for whatever reason, he looks down on him and has a second thought. The farmer decides to take the donkey into town and to see if anyone's interested in taking it or buying it from him. This last story I have is about a crook. A man who could care less about anything or anyone. He has no respect for the law, as he so often speaks against it. He lies, he cheats, he steals, and even on one occasion he killed another man. It would almost hurt you if you were to look at him. A man full of hate. Few would ever make acquaintance with this man. Now getting back to Jesus Christ. After completing a three and a half year ministry in which he saw the, re ra uh, the dead raised to life, the blind were able to see, the lame were able to walk, the deaf were able to hear, the sick were made whole, the multitudes were fed, and the most incredible sermons were ever spoke, he knew it was time to fulfill his purpose here on earth. Jesus knew it wasn't going to be easy, and he knew it was going to be the most gruesome ordeal a person ever had to go through. But yet, he also knew it pleased the Father, and it had to be done. In the last days leading up to the crucifixion, Jesus cried, made his... Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Men and women gathered around, laying palms on the ground, shouting out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Interestingly enough, only a couple days later, those very same people will be shouting something very differently about the Lord. I think it went something like this. Kill him. Crucify him. Destroy that man. You mean the exact same people? The exact same people. You mean how could they do something like that? You know, when we look at us in our lives, we see how many times do we cry out to the Lord saying, Lord God, forgive me, I'm sorry, I'm never going to do it again. And only a couple days later, we're doing the exact same thing, forgetting about him entirely. So we're not so different from all these people after all. One thing everyone in this room has in common what every other person in the entire world is eating food. Yeah, that's right. It's vital to existence. And without food over time, you will wither away and eventually die. Sometimes people gather together and have meals together. They sp people spend hours preparing and cooking food, making sure everything is just right. Friendships have been established. Relationships have been built just over the course of a meal. We can't help it. Without a doubt, over the course of the day, the thought comes into our head, what are we going to eat today? So, knowing how important food is to us, imagine right now, if I told you the next meal that you eat is going to be your last. That's exactly what the Lord knew when he gathered his disciples for the Last Supper. I'm sure the bread and the wine had a different kind of taste that night, knowing it would be the last thing he ever ate. In a room with men who have been by his side the last couple of years, it hits the Lord what's about to happen. He knows these men who say that they love him will scatter like sheep without a shepherd only a few moments later. And on top of that, one of them is about to betray him. I don't think there has ever been anyone else willingly, who willingly broke bread with someone else they knew was going to betray them only a few minutes later. But yet Christ did. Christ picks up a piece of bread, breaks it, and pauses for a second because he knows this broken and beaten body is represented by this piece of bread. He disperses it to his disciples. He then pours the wine, seeing it flow into a cup, only to realize that his own blood will soon be flowing. At this point, understanding what is to transpire, how every sin will soon be placed on him, 
a burden impossible for us to comprehend. Christ needed a moment. And as dinner wrapped up, he asked his disciples to do one thing with him. Can you please sing a hymn with me? And they all gathered together and sang a hymn. And maybe for the briefest of moments, Jesus felt the calmness. See, another thing we all have in common is music. We are hearing or singing songs every day. So if I were to tell you right now, the next song that you're about to sing is going to be the last song you ever sing, what are you going to sing? Would it be able to be something that would provide a calmness over you? So now, cro closer than ever to the cross, Jesus Christ decides to have some last minute fellowship with his father. He takes James, John, and Peter with him to Gethsemane, where they promptly fall asleep. The most crucial, impactful, eternity-changing moment is upon them. And all they can do is fall asleep. Now, if they could fall asleep during that moment, is it really so surprising to you that there are so many Christians sleeping right now in the world today? The Bible says Jesus being in an agony. An agony. Agony means extreme physical or mental suffering, so much to so that sweat drops of blood poured from his face. He bled from just the amount of mental suffering he endured before the cross. And there he was praying to the Father, if there was any other way, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thine will be done. A moment later, the garden was filled with torches held by the hands of soldiers ready to capture their prisoner. A kiss is placed on the Savior's cheek by a man who once swore loyalty. And at that moment, Christ's faith had been sealed. And still, knowing the cross was before him, the Savior took a moment to perform one last miracle and attach a soldier's ear back, which had been hacked off. And for whatever reason, unimpressed or just following orders, the soldiers take their captured prisoner to his destination. And along the way, and all through the night, Jesus endures humiliating acts, punches, and outrageous behavior perpetrated by those he came to save. The morning sun arises, and eventually Christ is brought before Pilate. Pilate not wanting to get involved, makes the people decide. And the angry mob, with its mind already made up, shouts out, kill him, crucify him. And while all this is unfolding, Jesus is just standing there, quiet, almost as in deep thought. He looks up and gazes up into the sky, into the heavens. And he's all of a sudden flashing back to eternity past. The son sitting alongside the father. The son remembering the excitement of his father. Son, it's time. Jesus looking up at the father smiling. Let's begin. And together with the Holy Spirit, they spake the words, and the heavens and the earth were created. A smack upside the head brings the Lord back to his current surroundings. And Pilate washing his hands of the whole matter, Jesus knew his time had arrived. And as a lamb led to the slaughter, Christ is paraded across the streets, ultimately reaching his first destination. He is told to get into position because the scourging is about to start. Out comes a mountain of a man, a Roman soldier, with a whip covered in broken glass, sharp, rusty rocks, 
and other unimaginable things. He lifts the whip up, and down it comes on the Savior's back, taking pieces of flesh and skin with it. Again, and yet again, ripping, tearing flesh, blood gushing out all over, a sight very few could stomach to even see. Finally, the soldier is ordered to stop and the Lord collapses to the ground. Another soldier lifts him up and says, Oh no, we're just getting started with you. As the Lord walks to his next destination, some members of the crowd begin to spit on his bloody body. Soldiers begin to rip the hair off his beard and punch him repeatedly. Another soldier says, wait a second, I have something special for the king of the Jews. He lifts it up and presents a crown of thorns. Immediately, seeing those crown of thorns, Jesus Christ has another flashback to eternity past. And he sees himself alongside the Father. Father, now that the heavens are created, what next? The father looking at the son says next, we're going to separate the waters from the dry land and we're going to create ground. Green field, trees, flowers blooming. It'll be perfect. Jesus said, wonderful father, that is good. A sharp pain hits the Lord as the crown of thorns is placed upon his head, piercing his skull and even more blood comes profusing out. The soldiers laugh. The soldiers mock, but what the soldiers meant as a mockery is only a glimpse of things to come. For one day Christ will be given a crown for which he is worthy. Amen. One soldier's voice overpowers all the other and can be heard very clearly. The cross is ready. The cross, it's ready. They take the Lord's beaten body on the cross, and one man gets a hammer and nails, puts his hand on that wood, puts the nail right in between his wrist, and bam, right through his wrist. Takes the other hand, lays it out on top of that cross, puts the nail inside the wrist, and bam, right in through that wrist. Finally, putting his legs together right through his foot, his feet. They lift him up, and there he hung completely naked for all the world to see. The sun begins to fade, and darkness is over all the land. Christ, now feeling what nobody else has ever felt, looks out into the darkness. And he has another flashback. He remembers saying to his father, now that everything is in place, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Christ says, we should create the sun to rule the day. And we should create the moon to rule the night. And we should create millions and millions of stars to go all around. Exactly what I was thinking, son, the father says. That thought being interrupted by a man hanging beside him saying, if you're the son of God, save us and yourself and get us off this cross. The other man says, Don't you fear God? Lord, remember, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The Lord says, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And as time went on, minute after minute, and Jesus, getting weaker and weaker, realizing he could use some water, cries out, I thirst. So in order to accommodate him, the soldiers provide him with a sponge full of vinegar. And as they give him that vinegar, some spills and enters into the many cuts of the Lord's body, burning his sores. As even more time passes by, and in the distance, the Lord sees a pile of dead bodies from previous executions. He notices the birds have begun flying all around them and have started to pick at the bloody corpses, dead corpses. 
He yet again flashes back into eternity past and remembers, saying to the Father, We've created the heavens. We've created the earth. We've created the sun. We've created the moon and the waters. You know what else it could be used? How about some creatures such as fish to swim the sea and some fowls of the air and birds to fly throughout the sky? Son, that is very pleasing in my sight. Speak it into existence. And while all this scene is unfolding, somewhere in the distance, there's a man. A farmer. Staring at the man who's being crucified in amazement. He remembers walking into town with his rebellious donkey that nobody wanted or even made an offer to. And then, on some chance, a couple of guys run over to him and say, we need this donkey. The farmer says, I don't think you want this one. And they, the men say to him, that's the exact one we need, for you see, the Savior will be riding into town today. But don't you understand? A man has never rode on this donkey before. But if you want him, you can take him. And to his amazement, sometime later on, he sees that calm donkey being rode on by that man that's on that cross. And he thinks to himself, how did he do it? He tamed and he humbled that beast when nobody else could. Somewhere else in that crowd of people stood another man, a murderer, a robber, and a thief, just staring at the cross. That man, Barabbas. He was let go by the people who wanted Christ to suffer instead. And all that man can do is think about as he saw that cross, that should have been me. I should be on that cross. And that man, he took my place. Finally, a woman can be seen weeping, sobbing uncontrollably. That woman, Mary Madeline. She was known around town as a loose woman before. But one day she was introduced to the Savior and her life was never the same. And all she can do is stare at that cross and think to herself, the first time I met that man was the first time in my life I ever felt clean. And you see, folks, that's how salvation works. The first step is you have got to be humble. And Jesus Christ can humble you. And until you're humbled, you just won't understand it. And then when you finally get humble, you know what you realize? That should be me on that cross. I should be the one on that cross right now. But he took my place. And then when you finally realize that, and when you see Jesus Christ for the first time, you know what will happen? It'll be the first time in your life you'll ever feel truly clean. So Christ, nearing the end, looks out into the crowd of people. And all he can see is people full of hate. People yelling, screaming, and mocking. He takes a deep breath and closes his eye. And one more memory comes into his mind of eternity past. Jesus is talking to the Father. Father, we created all of these wonderful things, and all of it is good. But shouldn't we create someone who can enjoy it all? The father says, yes, son. We're going to, it's time. We're going to create man. He'll be made in our image. And he will rule and have dominion over all of our creation. He can enjoy all the blessings of our handiwork. Man. Jesus exclaimed. I like the sound of that. So God spoke man into existence. And when the Lord Jesus looked at man, whom he had created, he saw that it was good. And he had unlimited, unconditional love for man. 
He opened his eyes, looked on at the crowd and all those hateful, angry faces, and maybe a tear began to run through his eye. He knew why he endured everything he did. He loved his creation man. And knowing all things have been fulfilled and remembering what he and his father had done on the seventh day, he cried out saying, it is finished. Gave up the ghost and just went on to rest for a while. And glory to God, he rose again three days later and will reign for all of eternity. But I want you to be honest now. The sacrifice, the brutality, the magnificence of the cross, it does not have the impact on you like it should. When was the last time you honestly prayed, gave thanks, meditated, or even thought about the cross? Time is running out. And very few things on this planet have any significance or importance at all. And the one thing that surpasses it all is the cross. Remember it. Cherish it. And live for it. And instead of going anywhere else, come back to the cross. Let's pray. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, the altar's open. <sighs> Piano is going to play something. Take a moment. Just take a moment. Nothing needs to be said right now. while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If there's someone here today who doesn't know what I'm talking about and has never experienced the cross, I ask while eyes are closed and heads are bended, bent down, it doesn't have to be that way. You could know about what I'm talking about and the love of God and Christ dying on that cross. If there's someone here who has never been born again, Without anyone looking, I would like you to please raise your hand right now. No one's going to call, call you out or embarrass you. But anyone who might not be saved here this morning. If you are saved by an uplifted hand, could I just say, I know that I'm saved. I know I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Please raise your hand. Okay. Okay. And for you, Christian, I know there are a lot of things going on in our lives and all over the world, but it's time we just remember and reflect upon what Jesus Christ did for us at that cross and the agony he experienced and how he loved us, his creation, enough to suffer it for us knowing that we couldn't do it in and of ourselves. I ask and pray that you would please during the course of the day and not only now but moving forward, always remember what Christ did and never forget. I'm going to pray right now. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this time that we can be here today. And more importantly, we are grateful for your son. Words cannot describe how much we owe and however we are indebted forever and all of eternity. We love you so much. And I know at times as children, we don't show it. We go out and do our own thing and we're off doing our own uh, our way. But God, I pray that you would just hit our hearts right now and help us remember the sacrifice that was made on that cross. And God, we can always remember and cherish it. I pray for everyone here, as time is running short, that we, the priorities will be set in our lives. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.